No slaughter yet was greater made ere in this island of people slain. Before this same with the edge of the sword as the books inform us of the old historians. Since hither came from the eastern shores the Angles and Saxons over the broad sea, and Britain sought fierce battle smit, overcame the Welsh most valiant earls and gained the land. This was an extract from a poem embedded into the Anglo-Saxon chronicles, detailing a great battle. On this day, the Anglo-Saxons defeated a combined force of Vikings, Scots and Welsh soldiers at a place called Brunanburh. This was known as the Battle That Made England. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Jammy History Podcast, the show that will talk about events from any time, any place. This episode will talk about the historic Battle of Brunanburh, its significance, as well as figure out where the battle even took place. I am your host, Jamie, and I will be your guide through this ongoing debate. If I were to go out and ask people in my area, which is currently Lancaster for reference, what they thought was the battle that made England, a good majority would most likely say the Battle of Hastings, and they wouldn't be wrong to say it. It was definitely a defining moment in the history of England. It established the Norman dynasty, and caused a cultural mixing between Saxon English and Norman French that wouldn't have been possible had they lost the battle. Other people might give alternative answers though, depending on what they perceive to be the defining battle in our history. Just before I started writing this, I decided to do the very responsible academic thing and ask Google what it thought was the battle that made England. And to my surprise, I got a bunch of articles about the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, which was a very interesting avenue to go down, mainly talked about the uh, foundations of English identity rather than England as a nation itself. But there is one battle that preceded both Agincourt and Hastings. This battle marked the first time that England would be a unified state under one banner since the time of the Romans. This battle was the Battle of Brunanburh. In order to approach this battle, I have to first start with a very, very, very quick whistle-stop tour of what England was like before this defining moment. For those of you who aren't familiar with Anglo-Saxon history, then buckle up because we're going to have a lot of ground to cover very quickly. The long road to Brunanburh begins around 400 AD. Yes, I, I did say we were starting early for this one. And during this period, Britain was ruled by the mighty Roman Empire, the Italian boys that had come a long way to conquer the lands of England and Wales, and they'd invested much into the development of those provinces. Truly, the glory of Rome was there for all to see. And then they left. They left! <laughs> they just left it! turned out that those days of glory were over for the Romans and the Romans had pulled their soldiers out of Britannia to help protect the homeland. But when one group leaves, another surely has to take its place. And ownership of the island transitioned from being owned by the Romans to being ruled by the Angles, the Saxons and the Jutes, Germanic people that had come over partly as mercenaries, as settlers, but in the end they took over the entire island. The transition period was messy, and I definitely need to do a whole episode covering it, because there's no way I could do it justice in a whistle-stop tour, but all you need to know is that by the end of this period, Romans were out, and England had been divided into seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. These kingdoms were Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia, Wessex, Sussex, Essex, and Kent, and all of them were vying for control over the others. They were stuck in a constant convection current when one kingdom would rise to the top before being replaced by another one. Even the most successful kingdoms, like Mercia, during the reign of King Penda in the early 7th century, which had a sphere of influence that stretched from Edinburgh to Kent, could not maintain their power beyond their leader's death. It almost felt like the kingdoms would be locked in this dance forever. 
and something had to change. And that's when 793 happened. 793 was the year that changed it all. People who know what happened in this year are already excited for this bit, I'm sure. For in this year, the seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms realised that a new challenger had entered the arena. This was no mighty invasion force coming from the Scottish lands up north, or from the Welsh kingdoms, but raiders from across the sea, coming on boats with the Danish and Nordic raiders set on loot in the coastline, starting at the monastery at Lindisfarne. The Lindisfarne raid was shocking to these kingdoms. It was unexpected and set a terrifying precedent. Following this iconic event came a period where Danes and Nords would raid the British coastline. The Viking Age was upon them. Now, not every Viking expedition was done by raiders. Several Viking bands sought to establish their own settlements in England, where they could live and trade with the established kingdoms. But the damage done by these raiders did greatly weaken many of the kingdoms in England, especially those closest to Scandinavia such as Northumbria and East Anglia. But as annoying as these pesky raiders are, they can be dealt with. It's not like they could land a massive army and... Oh no, where did all those Northmen come from? That's right, it's 865 and the Great Heathen Army has landed in East Anglia. This army was not like the raiding war bands that had come onto the shores of England. These were set out to conquer the country, not just raid any settlements they could. The great heathen army began by wintering in East Anglia before marching on Northumbria. They deposed the two kings of Northumbria. There was a bit of an ongoing uh, dispute where Aelof was trying to dispose the current king Osbert and he tried to recruit the Vikings into fighting uh, the war for him. It went about as well as you'd expect, and both Ayla and Osbert were killed for this, and the army took Etherwich and renamed it Jorvik, which is modern-day York. And just like that, poof, one of the seven great kingdoms was gone, just like that. The Viking army then turned its attention towards Mercia and forced them to submit to their rule. But even that was not enough to quench the thirst for conquest they had got, and they turned their attention towards East Anglia and defeated King Edmund in battle, or tied him to a tree and shot him full of arrows, depending on which version you want to go with. Hello, hello, it's your friendly neighbourhood editor Jamie here. I just wanted to say that I have absolutely no idea what was the cause of that mysterious noise in the background, nor do I have any way to remove it. So, sorry about that, and if it pops up again, sorry for the inconvenience. But for now, we shall return back to your regular scheduled programming. Enjoy! After that came a period where they would make expeditions into the Kingdom of Wessex and fight them for a bit, but it would usually end with them either being driven out by force or agreeing to leave in exchange for a payment. It seemed that the Kingdom of Wessex would also fall to the Great Heathen Army though given time, especially after the Viking leader Guthrum captured Winchester in a surprise attack and forced the king to flee to the marshes. This could very much have been where this chapter ends, making this a very short episode indeed. But history always finds a way to turn things around when you least expect it, and compel me not to clock out early, so thanks for that. The king that fled to the marshes was none other than Alfred the Great. I imagine a good number of people have just gone, oh that name sounds familiar. Isn't he the king that burned all those cakes by accident? And yes, that is the guy. Alfred was a great king, definitely not a good baker though. Whilst in the marshes and building his army, he was asked by a peasant woman to mind her cakes in the oven, and he clearly failed in his duties, getting himself disqualified from MasterChef 878 edition. Following that minor mishap, Alfred gathered together an army and defeated the Vikings at the Battle of Edgington. The Kingdom of Wessex was saved, Guthrum agreed to convert to Christianity and to return to East Anglia where he would rule. Following the battle also came an agreement, a peace treaty, that saw the country split in half. The Vikings would withdraw from Wessex and Western Mercian lands and establish their own kingdoms in a diagonal line from the north of the Mersey River to London. This split wasn't just seen as a divide of land, but a divide of culture, a divide in law, a divide in faith, a divide in identity. On the one side were the Saxons, on the other were the Danes and the Norsemen. Although many people belonging to both culture groups could be found in either Wessex or Daneland, from the figures on the top it was clear that for United England to be possible, one side had to be completely defeated by the other. 
Alfred spent his remaining years fortifying Wessex and winning a series of battles against the Viking armies that ventured across the border. And don't worry, he didn't try baking ever again afterwards. When he died in 899, the crown passed to his son Edward the Elder. Throughout his reign, Edward dedicated his attention to the conquest of southern Danelaw, and he worked very closely with his sister Ethelfled, Lady of the Mercians, to ensure that his father's vision of a united England came true. Oh, and uh, Ethelfled's uh, husband, Ethelred, was also there for the ride, but that's not important right now. Edward was able to secure East Anglia for the Saxons in 917, and Ethelfled uh, secured Leicester for the Saxons. I am honestly trying my hardest not to go on a massive tangent about how amazing Athelfled was and how we definitely all need to know more about her, but that is most definitely a story for another time. So stay tuned for that, we're going to come back to that topic. When Edward died in 924, there was only one kingdom that was left to conquer, and that was Northumbria. And with that, we have now finally arrived at the centrepiece of this episode, the reign of King Athelstan and the Battle of Brunanburh. At first, when I was writing this episode, I intended to do a much shorter recap uh, than what you've just heard. But if you don't know much about this period, then my initial draft would not have made much sense to you. Uh, It would have been something along the lines of the Vikings are here and Edward's pushed them back to Northumbria and Athelstan is now about to finish the mission. Which wouldn't have made sense unless I had explained why the Vikings were in England in the first place, who Alfred the Great or Edward the Elder were, and establish the names of the places that I'll definitely just be throwing around throughout this episode. So I had to start right from the beginning. But finally, we're up to date and we can talk about Athelstan. When Edward the Elder died, Athelstan, his eldest son, was made the King of Mercia. But wait, I hear you ask, wasn't Wessex the main kingdom involved? How is he going to unite England as the lesser kingdom? Well, you'd be right to think that. Mercia was indeed the junior partner uh, in this relationship, and Athelstan would have to be the junior partner to his younger brother Elthwood, who was chosen as the King of Wessex instead. At this point, I could talk about the great political intrigue going on between these two kingdoms, as they balance their desire to drive out the last of the occupied Northmen from English soil, with their own ambitions to be the dominant Saxon power in England. A battle between brothers. It would be great material for a TV show. Or at least, it would have been. If Elfwood had lived longer than 16 days, this potentially great schism between the brothers only lasted for 16 days. We were denied such an exciting character arc for Athelstan, but I guess life just had to make cuts from the initial script due to just going over the budget. So, just like that, Athelstan became the leading candidate for both kingdoms although there was still much opposition to his rule from Wessex, especially from its capital Winchester. It's not clear on how Athelstan managed to smooth over relations completely, and he was allowed to be crowned King of Wessex and Mercia, but it seems like he agreed to not marry or have any heirs, and that he would wear a little crown instead of a helmet, which apparently was the first time a king would do that here. I don't really understand how any of this actually helped his case, but If it works, then it works, I suppose. There was still some opposition to his reign, but it wasn't enough to pose an actual threat to his rule. And so, the story of Athelstan moved from the anticlimax of his rise to power to the anticlimax that was his conquest of Northumbria. The Viking king of Northumbria, specifically the area of York known as Dyra, was called Citric, and at first it seemed like there would be no conflict between Athelstan and Citric at all. They both looked at each other, decided that war would be a very bad business to get involved in, and Pinky promised not to invade each other or support their enemies. To seal this agreement, Athelstan arranged Citric to marry one of his sisters, bringing both kingdoms closer together. But before the colour choices for the friendship bracelets could be finalised, Citric died in 926. 
as far as Athelstan was concerned. Friendship doesn't last after death, and neither do any of the agreements, so we just strolled into York and seized it. Just like that, he had done it! The last of the major kingdoms was now under Saxon control. Citric's cousin Guthrif was less pleased by this betrayal of such a beautiful friendship, and he sailed over from Dublin to reclaim the Northumbrian throne. Then he saw Athelstan and his army and noped back out of there. Once again, the budget has denied us a climatic conclusion to this episode. But Jamie, I have some of you asking. This episode is about the battle that made England, right? Where's the bloody battle? Fear not, I've not forgotten the subject of this episode. His reign may have been a hybrid of anticlimaxes, consolidation, one very random expedition into Scotland, and legal rewrites which involved introducing some very extreme laws. For example, a 12-year-old that stole AP could be executed for their crime. Athelstan, he just had no chill. He just needed to take a chill pill or something. Even his own counsellors were concerned over how extreme some of these laws were. He did later raise the minimum age to 15 years, but I guess that's an improvement, so good job, Athelstan. But finally, the writers managed to find the funds for the climatic finale you're looking for, and that finale was the Battle of Brunnenburg. In 937, an alliance of people that had a grudge against Athelstan was formed, and they decided to settle the score with him once and for all. This was a combined force of Northmen, Scots and Britons, with some bonus Irishmen there too. Wessex was a mighty power at this point, and it was clear that only an alliance of his enemies could take down Athelstan. As Michael Livingston noted, the different members of this alliance, had agreed to set aside whatever political, cultural, historical and even religious differences they might have had in order to achieve one common purpose, to destroy Athelstan. Everyone had something to gain from this expedition into England. The Northmen army was led by Olaf or Anlaf III Guthrunson, King of Dublin. He wanted to reclaim York and perhaps Northumbria as a whole. The Scots were led by Constantine II of Alba, and they wanted revenge for Athelstan's previous expedition into Scotland, which happened for some very unclear reasons. The Britons were led by Owen, or Owain, of Stratclid, and they seem to be the oddball in this alliance, as they aren't mentioned as having an explicit reason for going to war. They were just there for the hell of it by that point. I mean, who would turn down such an offer? The alliance invaded Athelstan's land, raiding as they went along and pushing further into England, meeting up together somewhere along the road. Athelstan probably wasn't going to fight this and intended to wait until it all blew over, until he looked into his ye olde bank account and realised that he had enough money to raise an army to march north and fight them in the field. Not only that, but he could also finance the Athlink Edmund's army too, so they gathered their strength and marched up together to fight the anti-Athelstan alliance that were now gathered at a place referred to as Brunnenburg. The details of this battle are vague. The existence of this battle gets mentioned in a variety of chronicles and sources, but they don't linger on the details of what actually happened that day, or how many there were even were on the field. We only know that it was a big battle because several sources, such as Elthwaid's Chronicon, refer to it as the Great War. The only source that gives us more detail is the poem that you heard an extract from at the beginning. The battle was, by all accounts, bloody for both sides. At least five kings were killed over the course of the day, along with many of the leader's personal friends and family. Constantine II lost his son, and Athelstan lost two of his cousins. But in the end, after what must have been hours of fighting, the Saxons finally broke through the enemy's shield hall and routed them off the field. Athelstan had won the day. England would remain united, though it was at the cost of many lives. The slaughter was so great on both sides that peace was quickly agreed afterwards. Anlaf returned to Dublin, and Constantine and Owain returned back north to their lands. Although this victory was decisive, 
It did thwart Athelstan's ambitions for the island, for he had aspired to unite the entire island under the English banner, but likely lacked the necessary strength to do this. This battle is therefore significant because it drew the line between what would be considered English and what could be considered Scottish. For such a significant battle, you would expect this to be at least mentioned more often, but the great irony is that we don't even know where the battle actually happened. The lack of a specific description of where the battle took place means we are forced to piece together a series of unclear factors in order to deduce its true location. So it might be easier to start with by explaining what we know for certain. For starters, the battle had to happen within the borders of modern-day England. It was the battle that defined those borders, after all, and the anti-Athelstan coalition was invading the territory. Secondly, it had to be somewhere that all of the three alliance members could easily reach in order for their armies to merge into one. For Constantine and Owain, this isn't a major issue, as both shared the same route into England, so a meetup between them was natural. But Anlaf had to sail his army over from Ireland, therefore there are limitations to where he could land his force. He would either have to keep his army close to the coastline to maintain contact with his ships, his only way back to Dublin, or keep them in a friendly port. The rest of the useful information about the battle is sketchy or conflicting, but there are two main theories put forward by historians. The first of these theories is that the battle happened outside the town of Bromborough, in the Wirral. For those listeners not from the UK, the Wirral is a small peninsula in the northwest of England, in between Chester and Liverpool, next to the River Mercy. This theory is the most widely accepted by historians, and it was put forward by John McNeil Dogson. It mainly draws on the comparison in names. Bromborough does sound awfully like Brunnenborough. In fact, it's one of the few places in the country that has a similar name. Places in England, on the whole, haven't changed drastically from what they were referred to as during this period. For example, I'm from Chester, which used to be referred to as Caister. London was called London, and York was Jorvik. Could it be that Bromborough was initially called Brunnenborough? One of the most confusing parts about this debate is what does Brunnenborough even mean? The Burr part of the name means fort, that much is clear. During the reigns of Alfred and Edward, they built a series of these forts across the country to help defend the kingdom from Viking raiders, as well as guard the borders. Therefore, Brunnenborough has to be located along one of the historic borders between the Saxons and the Danes. One of the major Mercian borders with Northumbria was the Wirral. In 907, Athelfled, Lady of the Mercians, granted the Viking leader Ingemund land to settle in the Wirral. Then following a failed attack on Chester, she constructed a series of burrs along the border to hinder further incursion. One of these forts might have been Bromborough in the Wirral. Sadly, the first part of its name, Brunnen, is something of an enigma for what it could be referring to. Attempts to deduce its meaning have led to a series of possibilities. Bruna could be a reference to a person, making this the fort that he owned, though sadly we just don't know who this Bruna was. Or perhaps it's the colour brown, as in Old English, brown is Bruna. Naming your battle the Battle of the Brown Fort is about as vague a description as you could get. It could also be referring to the River Bruna in Lancashire. Maybe it was a fort that was built up there. We simply cannot tell. And if we did, it probably would make this situation a whole lot easier. But there is another element to the Wirral argument that gives it credit. Logistics. One of the main issues facing the anti-Athelstan alliance was getting Amlaf's army over to mainland England from Ireland. Amlaf would have to avoid landing his army in dangerous territory. Now, the Wirral is unusual in the sense that it's not an ideal landing zone with its marshy terrain and the... Uh, River Mersey was not ideal to be sailing down, but it is wonderfully positioned. The Wirral is roughly the most central point in the British Isles, and can easily be reached from Dublin. All Anlaf had to do was pile his men onto his boats and sail along the northern coastline of Wales, and he'd reach the Wirral just like that. From here, he could march his army across the country to York or march south into Mercian lands and cause some havoc there. 
Previous Viking expeditions into Mercia often favoured crossing the Mersey River into the Wirral and marching south over attacking across the Midlands. There were a strong series of burrs in the Midlands, and it seemed the Vikings wanted to avoid contact in that area whenever possible, and so they favoured the Wirral crossing. It was not only a possible strategy for the Alliance to employ, but seemingly a long-standing favoured method of raiding deep into enemy territory. But the greatest benefit for the Wirral argument is the large quantity of archaeological finds that have been discovered in the Bromba area. Volunteer excavators have been toiling away in the fields around Bromba to see if they could find anything that would confirm the battle took place here. And although they haven't found anything like a massive pile of swords or the body of a man holding a sign saying the battle was fought here, they have found a large quantity of metal artifacts dating from the 10th century. The theory put forward by the Wirral Archaeology Group is that the concentration of artefacts indicates the presence of a military camp based here. Could this be Anlaf's camp? If so, then the proximity of the camp to Bromba would confirm the location of the battle beyond doubt. At the time of recording, there are still ongoing archaeological digs to find the concrete evidence needed to confirm if this was the battle site. Not everyone buys the theory that the battle happened in the Wirral. Michael Wood in particular argues that the battle instead happened in Yorkshire. His argument focuses more on literary accounts of the battle that would imply that the battle happened elsewhere. A 12th century account by John of Worcester reads, Anlaf, the pagan king of the Irish, and of many islands, incited by his father-in-law Constantine, king of the Scots, entered the mouth of the river Humber with a great fleet, against whom King Athelstan and his brother, the Athling Edmund, launched an attack with their army in the place called Brunnenburg. What Wood draws attention to is this Humber landing, supposedly done by Anlaf's army. If Anlaf landed in the Humber, then his army would be close enough to seize York, ultimately the primary target for Anlaf personally. And if he did seize York, then he would have had the Northumbrian nobles on his side. But Jamie, I hear some of you asking, isn't it a bit much to assume the Northumbrian nobles would have jumped ship that quickly? Well, you'd be correct, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret. After Athelstan died, he was succeeded by his brother Edmund I in 939. That same year, good old Anlaf was still about and decided to try his luck one last time in one last hurrah against the Saxons. And he actually managed to seize York and the Northumbrian elites did pledge their support to Anlaf until their eventual defeat in 942, and Edmund regained control of the north. The question then is, did Anlaf decide to repeat the same tactic as he had done in the Brunnenburg campaign, or had he changed tactics knowing that he'd failed the previous time? So we've established that Wood believes it took place in Yorkshire, but does he have a more specific idea? Well, he offers up an alternative name for the battle, the Battle of Wendon. Wood highlights a passage from the 10th century annals, known as the Historia Regum, which reads, King Athelstan fought at Wendon, and drove into flight King Anlaf with 615 ships, and Constantine, King of the Scots, and the King of the Cumbrians with all their host. This passage likes to throw a spanner in the works. What even is the Battle of Wendon? Where the hell is Wendon? If this is the location that was known to us, then it might help pinpoint where Brunnenburg took place. This is probably the weakest element of Wood's argument, as he sort of just assumes that Wendham is the name of a hill near the River Went, and then lists a variety of hills around the area that the battle could have taken place at. But on the whole, there is a lot of logic in his theory, and it would just be rude to dismiss it so easily but it needs some archaeological signs that could help point to a singular location, because Yorkshire's a bit broad, let's be honest. We've reached the end of this segment, and what have we learned? That the early medieval period can be a bloody confusing mess to sort through? The issues surrounding the debate of Brunnenburg are caused by a lack of available information, forcing us to rely on the fragments of evidence available and filling the gaps with our own deductions and interpretations. Despite them having differing opinions on the matter, both Dogson and Wood agree on one point, 
that they both can't say for certain that they know where the battle took place. All they can do is speculate based on what is available. So where do I think the Battle of Brunema took place then? Well, much like Dogson and Wood, I can't say for certain. However, I do lean more in favour of the Wirral argument. I do acknowledge the credibility of the Yorkshire argument, but the Wirral argument has a lot more that's logical to me. Plus, I gotta respect the, my uh, local Wirral friends, haven't I? But there's only one thing for it. The only way that we're gonna get the truth on the matter. I gotta get working on that time machine. And I gotta go. Back to Brunnenburg. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. Writing the script for this took way longer than I expected, and I had to revise it so many times. But I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, then be sure to follow the podcast and either my Instagram or Twitter accounts, or both. Both is good. I also now have a Patreon if you wish to follow me on that too. You can get a shout out like the lovely Lara at Historic Hills and my very own dad who have already donated to me. So big thanks to you three. In the next episode, we will be delving into the life of a very small man who had an extraordinary life. A court dwarf whose life was certainly no joke. You might even get a bonus guest episode in between. I just have to organize one for the Christmas uh, holiday. So uh, keep an eye out for updates on that. But for now, stay tuned, and I will see you next time. Goodbye, all.